Good morning, everyone. It's time for us to begin. If you want to take a seat, we'll have some announcements to share with you before we begin our worship service. We continue to have those on our prayer list that we want to continue to remember both publicly and privately. We want to continue to remember Maxine and the loss of her sister, uh, Barbara Cecil, Ben Foreman, Dorothy Strong and her husband, uh, Greg. Danny Kite has been moved to Spanish Oaks and Miss Lynn. We want to continue to remember her and her family. Uh, also, uh, Polly told me this morning that she will have a heart catheterization in the morning. So we want to remember her and our prayers that that is, uh, turns out to be okay. There are a lot of friends of family members here that have COVID and are sick, and we want to continue to remember uh, them. I'll just mention this morning, uh, not all the elders are here, but we had agreed to follow the mayor's uh, guidelines, and he has lifted the mask wearing so we have some people this morning with them off, and that's fine. But if you want to leave them on, uh, that's fine also. But that's kind of where we are uh, this morning. That changes when the other two get back. Why well, we'll, <laughs> we'll announce that also. We have a ladies' Bible study uh, Saturday, December the 4th at 11 a.m., and that is at Sharon Homan's uh, home. Also next Sunday, Brother Roy Knight will be uh, speaking, is that next Sunday? Yeah, December the 5th. Uh, he's in country, I think he's been with Mitch and them and been traveling around there in Columbia today. Uh, we had some good news, he was up at Parkway and spoke and they made a $2,500 donation. So we're uh, pleased and blessed with some of the things that are happening there. I do want to mention while I have time this, this morning, Steve Yoho is the contact elder for November or for December. His number and email is in the bulletin. And uh, in order for, to have better communication with the congregation and also to have a better organization with the elders, uh, that's a process that's used at places. And, if you have something that you need to get to the meeting to be announced or, or talked about by the elders, see that person because he's in charge of the elders meeting and we'll conduct that meeting. It's just a simplified way. Of course, you can talk to an elder anytime you want to uh, or any of us, but anything really important, get to that person and he'll make sure that it gets to, on the agenda uh, to be talked about. Also, we'd like to ask you to submit to the elders names of people that you think, uh, men you think are qualified to be deacons. Uh, we want to talk to them and move ahead by the first of the year. Uh, we need more deacons for the work here at Central. The December Wednesday Bible study will be uh, uh, why having the heart of Jesus is important. Uh, I know that's a month that a lot of people uh, travel uh, but if you can, we encourage you to come and be with us as we study that. There'll be a couple of ladies in the back with gift bags. If you're visiting this morning, we're glad to have you. And uh, they want to give you a, a gift bag before you leave. Joy will be leading the singing this morning. Brother David Nichols will have our opening prayer. Uh, Dennis Vera will, will preside at the table. Uh, Keaton with the sermon and Jonathan Stroud will have our closing prayer. At this time, we'll join in the singing. You are the words in the music. You are the song that I sing. You are the melody. You are the Praise you.
Would you bow with me, please? Father, we're so deeply thankful for this wonderful time that we have together. Father, we're so thankful of the time of year it is that we come and we're thankful so much. But, Father, we're so thankful for you and for you giving your son to us. And so thankful for that hope of eternity that we have with you. Father, we'd ask that you would continue to be with this family here. We have many that are sick. We have many that are undergoing uh, procedures this next week. Bless them and be with them as only you can and protect them in everything that goes on. Bless everything that we're doing here and continue to bless us. Be with Keaton tonight, today as he speaks to us. Uh, Be with the many that are traveling for this holiday and bring them back. And Father, bless us always. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I want to be a worker. We'll sing this before our lesson. So any who wish to may stand while we sing. First and third verse. I want to be a worker for the Lord. I want to love and trust His holy word. I want to sing and pray and be busy every day in the vineyard
Please be seated. Good morning. It's good to see everyone here this morning. I hope you had a great Thanksgiving. It was certainly a special one for us to be able to be with the twins, and even though they don't quite remember it, we have taken more than enough pictures, I can promise you that. Uh, we will remember it, and I hope your family had a, a great Thanksgiving as well. I'd like for you to turn over into the book of First John. First John, if you are visiting with us or, or just need a refresher, because we have kind of taken a little bit of a, a sabbatical, if you will, away from First John, we, we talked about uh, deacons, and then last week we talked about being thankful and thanksgiving and things like this, and so we are kind of back in First John, looking at our, our series is called The Heart of the Matter. And, and just to kind of refresh you, it will come up again this morning, you know, John, uh, when he wrote the Gospel of John, was a very rigid, very strict, very stern man. That's kind of the way Scripture records him as well as secular history points him to being a very kind of no-nonsense kind of guy. We looked at when, when he was one of the few that went and was really close to Christ when he, when he was being crucified. He ended up taking care of Jesus' mother Mary. And, and one thing led to another, and he really kind of softened as he got older. And he eventually wrote First, Second, and Third John, and and First John in particular really focuses on this theme of love, and that's where you see in this graphic a study of First John. We're going to look kind of through all these things. We picked up, or we're going to pick up in chapter two, um, starting in about verse eighteen, reading through about verse twenty-seven. If you want to go ahead and find that in your Bible. Um, I read one commentator talking about this because there's a real stark contrast, and I, and I kind of reminded you of kind of the love theme of John, because if you just kind of looked at 1 John at, at kind of the 30,000-foot view, you would certainly see this overwhelming theme of loving Christ, loving the church, loving each other. Um, it, it is a very noticeable theme. Then you get into the latter portion of chapter 2, what we're going to talk about today and there's this real kind of jump off point where John kind of seemingly pauses and shift gears entirely to talking about what is essentially false teachers and how as Christians to defend against those that, that don't believe what you believe. And, and more particularly than that, those that are actively seeking to tear down um, your faith, the church, any of these kinds of things. It's not just talking about somebody that you have a theological difference. That's not really what he's talking about here. These are people that have a very active agenda to come in and say, I want to tear down the church, I want to tear down you, I want to, you know, whatever this might be. So I read one commentator write it this way, loving, again, the, the, the theme of 1 John, as an agent of Jesus, as an agent of Christ, Love means loving others enough to stay grounded in Jesus' truth. So while on the surface, this portion of 1 John seems very removed from the love theme, but I would articulate to you, and this commentator kind of agreed, that John is really keeping with the theme of love. Very kind of different presentation, but he's in essence saying if you love somebody enough, if you want to be an agent of Christ, you want to be a worker, I appreciate Joey leading that song, if you want to be a worker for Christ, part of that is owing it to other people and to yourself to stay grounded in the truth of Christ so that you can share that with other people and you won't be shaken in the process. So as you're reading through this, if you think, man, this feels very different than what we've been reading, consider this kind of idea. It's still very in the theme of love, kind of, I would articulate, in the, the tough love category that sometimes we have to have. If you got your note outline uh, via the bulletin, you saw that we're calling this defending against deception, because that's the idea, right? You look in 1 John chapter 2, and you, you get this very clear understanding, and in fact, we're going to look at a couple verses here where there's some kind of real hot-button words that, that kind of jump off the page at us. But nonetheless, John is talking about those that are coming in that want to tear down the church, that want to tear down Christ as the Messiah. Again, we're not talking about slight little differences. We're talking about big, massive, huge, tear-down Christianity type differences here, and that's what John is referencing. Let's read together, and I'd like to read this whole thing if you'll allow me, and then we'll certainly pull some select passages back out. But first, John um, chapter 2, and starting in verse 18. Now, there's a couple words that I want you to pay attention to, and we'll come back to those in a second. But starting in verse 18, children, it is the last hour. We're going to come back to that. 
As you have heard, that Antichrist is coming. We're going to come back to that. So now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they are not of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One. We'll come back to that. And you, are, and you have all knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he who denies that Christ or that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. Remember that word. If you have heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he has made to us, eternal life. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. But the anointing that you receive from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you, you everything and is true and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in him. Again, if you were to just scan through this, it seems heavy, it seems maybe a little bit confusing, it may seem even a little bit crazy on certain parts, but I, w- I want to break this down for us because John is trying to get across a very simple message. And, and as we've already talked about, it's as much a reminder as anything. First John is not a lot of new information, even to the first century people that would be receiving this firsthand. A lot of John's purpose is I need to remind you what you already know. Because remember, this is after Christ has already come. John's an old man. John remembers being with Jesus firsthand. He remembers the teachings of Jesus firsthand. And he knows that a lot of the, the early Christians remember that as well. So it's kind of a lot of just shaking everybody and saying, don't you remember what Jesus taught us not 30, 40 years ago? That's kind of what he's doing here in chapter 2. So we're going to identify three things, and if you have a bulletin, you'll see three outlines. We're going to talk about the problem, we're going to talk about the solution, and then we're going to talk about the practice. And this is kind of, I, I didn't come up with this, this is how John kind of lays it out. He says, here's the problem we've got going on. Here's the solution to fix all this, and here's going to be the practice of how we're going to go out from this point and put all this into our everyday lives. Here's the problem. People will come who oppose the Messiah. And again, I'm going to reiterate this until I'm blue in the face because I I want no misunderstanding. This is not talking about little differences. This is not talking about, you know, sitting around a Thanksgiving table, you know, kind of bickering about the fine points of theology. It's not what we're talking about. This is somebody who is going to come in and say, Jesus is not the Son of God. Jesus did not get resurrected on the third day. Jesus cannot save you from your sins. Salvation is not through God the Father. And in fact, we're going to look here in a minute, one of the main groups that they were fighting against was the Gnostics, which we've talked about before. But essentially, they had a lot of people that came up and they said, what you have is not enough. What you have through Scripture is not enough. If you will come and pay a fee, we will anoint you with oil. We will do all this stuff and we can give you what you need. That's what John is really fighting against. But he says there will be people who will come who will oppose the Messiah. So 1 John chapter 2, let's read together verse 18 again. Children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard, that Antichrist is coming. So now many Antichrists have come, plural. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. Now, if you read through this and thought, oh, buddy, we're getting a last day's talk. We're going to go off the deep end into the weird stuff. It's not this. You know, we think about this idea of Antichrist and last days, and and the Bible does talk about what's going to happen as much as we know what's going to happen in the end. That's not this. When we talk about the word Antichrist, I want to kind of give you the Greek, and then I want to give you what it actually means. Hollywood, TV, movies has really, you know, Dan Brown has done a number with, with, you know, things like the Da Vinci Code and stuff like this that kind of reference different whatnots. But the Antichrist as described here is a very general term. So the first thing I want you to know is that when it talks about the Antichrist, it's not one person. It can't be by its definition. It is a plural Greek word. I found it interesting that every U.S. president, sitting U.S. president, has been called the Antichrist publicly, except for one, and that was Gerald Ford. I don't know why. But everyone except for Gerald Ford has been called the Antichrist in public, on paper. It can't be one person. 
one specific person, that is. It, it can be an individual. But the, the definition here is the opponent or an opponent of the Messiah. So as you see from that definition, that's not describing one person. Many people could qualify as what John is describing as Antichrist to the degree that he says, so now many Antichrists have come. So we see the word Antichrist and we get a little you know, shaky because we think it's going to, but really you could sub the word opponent in. Let's reread this verse with just the word opponent and I think this will sound far more elementary than as we read Antichrist. Children, it is the last hour and as you have heard, the opponent is coming. So now many opponents have come, therefore we know it is the last hour. That's what John is wanting to get across. When we think about the idea of the last hour, I didn't put a slide here because it's really not that big a deal, but the last hour is essentially in the Greek referring a, a change of time. So when it's talking about the last hour, what it's referencing is there was a change in history when Christ came. That was kind of the first change. And then he's basically saying sometime between then and when Christ come back, when he comes back again, which we know is a biblical idea, he will come back and collect his own. In that middle time, that passage of time is what gets translated as the last hour. All that means is there's a passage of time that there's an implication of readiness. That, that's, you know, and, and the Greek is, is kind of a little bit different than English. They, they pack a lot of meaning in a few different words. But that's what the last hour means. It's not saying that it's happening today. It is saying be ready, and that's a, a biblical idea. But it just means from the time that Christ came until the time Christ will come again. So again, children, it's the last hour. Essentially just saying we need to be ready because we don't know when Christ will come again. Remember, they heard Jesus say this firsthand. Be ready. It'll come like a thief in the night. They're acutely aware of this. You have heard the opponents are coming so that the opponents are coming. Therefore, we know it is the last hour. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 22 kind of defines a little bit um, of, of who this opponent might be. Remember, generically speaking, it's anyone who opposes the Messiah, specifically the divinity of who the Messiah is. But Verse 22 simply says, who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? Again, identifying, we're not talking about little, little issues here. We're talking about somebody that denies that Jesus is the Son of God. Remember, kind of remove the bias of the Antichrist. This is just somebody that's coming in and saying, Jesus is not God. Jesus is not the Messiah. This is is the Antichrist. For, for all the, the hubbub and the, the flair that comes out of this, Hollywood has made this a big deal. There's TV shows that talk about this. But, but John is very clear about this. You, we didn't need necessarily the Greek to know what this word means. It's somebody who denies the, the Messiah is who he says he is. He who denies the Father and the Son. So John is saying this is the problem. We got a lot of people in here who oppose Jesus as the Messiah. He says, you all remember him. We were there. We heard this. Remember what you once knew. The false teachers were kind of giving this message. They were saying, nothing you have is enough. This was kind of the pitch of the Gnostics. Now, if you're going to think, well, Keaton, this sounds a little bit like what's in the world today. You're dead on. We hear this today. It's not called Gnosticism, but we hear it today. Nothing you have is enough. Salvation's not enough. Forgiveness is not enough. Jesus isn't enough. None of it's enough. But I, this is kind of generically speaking, the, the Gnostic kind of superstars that they put up in front of everybody, I, for a fee, can provide you with what is enough. If you will come and let me anoint you with this certain oil, if I can give you this certain blessing, then you're going to be enough. In fact, John got cursed many times by the Gnostic priest that said if they ever left, you were going to get sick and you were going to die and all these kinds of things. And, and of course, none of it came, came to be. That This is silliness. But this is what they were believing. That there, It was kind of that you've heard of fear of missing out. They had a severe case of FOMO. That they were thinking there's something else that Jesus forgot to tell us that these guys must have that we need to know. And this is what John is directly fighting against. He says, this is the problem, and we've got to figure out a solution. 
I want you to consider this idea. Not everything that sounds spiritual is worthy of being consumed. Because the Gnostics spewed a really good story. You know, they really weaved a pretty nice tale of, well, you know, this is this. And some of even the more successful ones really kind of touched on Jesus as a great teacher. You know, they didn't want to offend the new Christians, so they kind of threw Jesus a metaphorical bone, but then they said, well, but he's not enough. He's good, and you're not wrong for, for, for studying and worshiping, but he's not enough. He's not salvation-giving. You've got to find something else for that, and I just so happen to have it in my bag of tricks. This is kind of the pitch that they were giving. Not everything that sounds spiritual is worthy to be consumed, and that's true even today. You know, you go on Facebook, you go on even news outlets, you go all around and you will hear things that sound spiritual. They sound Bible-esque. In fact, I've got a whole series that's just simply called, Did Jesus Say That? Because there's a lot of things that we can pitch that sounds Bible-y, but in reality they aren't. In fact, some of them are, are, are very contradictory to what the Bible has to say, but they kind of have that sound to them. Not everything that sounds spiritual is worthy of being consumed. The second part is the protection, or is essentially the plan, the solution. I stuck with the P theme, but it's essentially what we're saying is the solution, and that is the knowledge of Scripture. There's a part of this that we just don't have time to dive into, talking about abiding in in Christ, abiding in the Word. There's some real deep stuff in here that I wish we had time, and maybe we'll dive into it another day. I want you to simply know what this word abide means, because it means it's important for us. But essentially, they're saying, you have protection from those who oppose the Messiah because you have the Word given to you by the Spirit. If you want to boil it down to its most basic form, he's saying when you become a Christian, and we've got tons of verses that point us to this idea, when you become a Christian, you are given the gift of the Spirit. Jesus says, it's better for me to leave and the Spirit to come behind me than for me to stick around. So he says, when you become a Christian, you're given the Spirit, which is helping you understand what has already been revealed by God. So in essence, the protection we have, the solution we have to combat those that might oppose the Messiah, Christ is saying, look what you already have been given. You have already been given all the answers that you need. It's all right here. And you've also been given the Spirit to help you understand all this. This is the solution, the protection that we see here. 1 John chapter 2, 20-21. But you have been anointed by the Holy One. Now, we're going to come back to that word anointed. Essentially, all that is, is John being very skillful in his writing. Because again, the Gnostics were were giving this pitch of, I'm going to anoint you with oil for a fee, and that's going to forgive your sins. That's enough. And so all John is really saying, don't get hung up on the anointing. That is really for the first century crowd. All he's wanting them to understand is this pitch that the Gnostics are giving you, anointing with oil, all this shenanigans, he says it's foolishness. He says you have been anointed by the Holy One. That's all you need. And you have knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth. That's essentially saying I'm reminding you. I'm writing you not because this is new information, but because you know it and because no lie is of the truth. I'm reminding you of what you already know. If you are a Christian, you have been anointed. You've been given the gift. You've been given the scripture. And that's a really beautiful thing. I heard one commentator write it this way, and this kind of touches more on that anointing that the Gnostics were talking about. But John is combating the Gnostic teaching by using the words anointing and knowledge. The Gnostics are claiming that they received an exclusive ritual anointing that gave them special knowledge. John rejects this false doctrine by reminding the disciples that they have an anointing that gives them all knowledge and knowledge of all things. And what he's not saying that just by becoming a Christian you automatically know everything. What this commentator is pointing to correctly is you have access to anything that you would need through Scripture. All things from life and godliness are found here. And that's what John is kind of pointing to as well. You don't need any of this second stuff. You don't need anointing again. You don't need any other oil. You've already been given the gift. 
Acts chapter 10, and this is kind of where that word anointed gets used multiple times. I just wanted to give you a little bit of context of this. When God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, this is that same word anointing here. It's essentially a gift being given. In 2 Corinthians 1, 21 and 22, now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us. John is saying, if you're a Christian, the anointing's already been done. You don't need any of this other. Set his seal of ownership on us and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. If you're a Christian, this is you. Christ has anointed. God has anointed. And it's a beautiful idea. But what what he's really referencing back in 1 John is combating that Gnostic idea. He's just reminding them, you already know all of this. And then lastly, as we kind of land the plane, and and, and this is going to be a little more open-ended because I want you to kind of sub in some thoughts here, but it's the practice. Essentially saying, okay, we know the problem. There are those that might oppose Christ. We know the solution. If I'm a Christian, I've already been given all the knowledge I need to combat this. But now, how do I put it into practice? How do I put this into play? 1 John chapter 2, and I'd like to reread 24 through 27. 24 through 27. Let what you've heard from the beginning abide in you. That'll be important. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father, and this is the promise that he made to us eternal life. I write these things to you, that those who are trying to deceive you, but the anointing that you receive from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in him. If you kind of notice that the word abide came up a lot, you're right. And the word abide, and this is where I'm simply going to leave this because I want us to start thinking about this idea and we're going to touch on it more in sermons to come. But the word abide simply means to live in. It means to be so intimately involved that, that, that we are one in the same with it. I think John kind of points us to three ways, and John and other places in Scripture, three ways that we can abide as a Christian. One of which is to abide in the truth of the gospel. You know, John's kind of touched on this a little bit. He says, listen, you don't need anything else because Christ himself gave you everything you've needed Enough for salvation, enough for forgiveness of sins, enough to be reconciled with God. You don't need anything else. Trust, abide in, live in the power of the gospel. Abide in scripture. John's definitely touched on this. Abide in the scripture to know that you've been given everything you need for life and for godliness. And then lastly, he says, abide in the spirit. He says, you've been given all of this via the Spirit. We know that from John and from other places in Scripture. As a Christian, it's a gift you're you're given. You know, we're going to be talking in January on Sunday morning in our adult class. We're doing a whole series on the Holy Spirit. We shy away from it a lot because, truthfully, there's parts we don't know. And and, and I'll give you that huge disclaimer when I begin teaching. There there are are large parts of this that I I can't give you the, the definite answer. But what I do know is that... Christ, the Son, and God, the Father, point to the idea that as Christians, we are blessed by the Holy Spirit. We are blessed to have access to the Holy Spirit. We as Christians should never shy away from what God points us to. If Christ points us to the Spirit, we should be involved with the Spirit in one way or another. The heart of the matter. Again, this is a whole book talking about love, and we've certainly taken what seems like a detour, but my prayer is that you see how it's not. That love is essential in the defense against deception. That when we look at our own faith, maybe more importantly, we look at the faith of those around us, that there are times we need to be mindful of the things that John's talking about here. That those that might oppose what we believe and have the ability to stand against this. If you're not a Christian this morning, we want to extend the invitation to you. That you might receive that gift. We've talked about it all morning that you might receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, that you might be blessed and have your sins forgiven through the waters of baptism. 
If you just need prayers or support, we'd love to help you with that as well. If, you, if we can do anything for you, would you come let us know about it as we stand and as we sing together? After this, we will uh, we'll have our communion. <clears throat> have you seen Jesus, my Lord? He's here in plain view. Take a look, open your eyes. He'll show it to you. Have you? the face of Christ 
trust in your brother, then I say. Good morning. As we gather around the Lord's table this morning in remembrance of the sacrifice that Christ made for us, I'd like to focus our thoughts on how the Lord's Supper can, in many ways, be a a model for our own daily meals and suppers. I believe that what we learn and practice around the communion table is is meant to spill out into the rest of our lives. The grace we receive during the communion is meant to shape the way that we relate to other people. One of the main ways we can do this is through sharing meals together. We just celebrated the Thanksgiving holiday and I suspect that most of us gathered around a a table with friends and family and uh, shared a rather generous meal, and we and did that together. I also expect that someone at that meal offered grace or asked a blessing just prior to the meal, expressing gratitude for all of our blessings. The saying of grace at a family and shared meals can be energized by our focus on grace here around this communion table as well. At this communion meal, we express our gratitude for the promise of salvation that we receive through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Every meal can become an expression or an occasion for gratitude. Meals are a powerful expression of welcomeness and friendship in every culture around the world. Sharing meals together with people uh, creates that community of people and thereby proclaims God's grace. So would you bow with me as we give thanks? Almighty God, we come before you now and thank you for blessing us and for the gift of grace, for the gift of salvation. We ask, Father, for your blessing upon this emblem that represents the slain body of our Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray that we'll do so in a manner that will be pleasing to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Would you bow with me as we give thanks for the fruit of the vine? Heavenly Father, we continue our prayer to you, again thanking you for the blood of Christ that was shed for the remission of our sins. We ask, Father, for your blessing upon this emblem that represents that shed blood. We ask, Lord, for your blessing upon those who partake of it here this morning. In Christ's name we pray, amen. This time we also 
take an opportunity to give back to the Lord some of the blessings that he's given to us. This morning I want to stress that if you give, give because you want to. You know, Jesus was an awesome example for all of us. If you think about it, he had everything. He had all the power over heaven and earth. Yet he gave it, gave it all up for us. He made himself poor so that we could be rich. So that we could be called sons and daughters of the Most High God. Ask yourself, did he have to do that? No. Did someone have to twist his arm and make him do it? No, I think it was just the opposite. But Jesus purposed in his heart to become a sacrifice for us. He was determined to restore us back to God. And in that, there was no stopping him from doing it. As Christ followers here today, let's follow his example. No one's telling us that we have to give. There's not going to be someone waiting for you at the door as you go out. But if you want to give, you have that opportunity this morning to do that. Listen to what 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses, seven and, or verses 6 and 7 says. He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. So don't give today because you feel you have to, but rather give if that's something that you've decided to do, something that you've purposed in your heart. Would you bow with me, please? Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you. Thank you, Lord, for watching over us and for blessing us so richly. We ask, Father, that you bless this portion of these gifts that we return to you. Watch over the elders who make decisions on how those gifts are used. We pray, Father, that they'll make decisions that will be pleasing to you. And we pray, Father, that these gifts will be multiplied so that your word can be spread further and further and further throughout the world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Once again, we want to thank everybody for being here, especially any visitors that we had. And we're glad to be through a holiday week and start of the holiday season, so there'll be a lot of traveling over the next few weeks. But everybody be careful out there. Remember our service uh, Wednesday, 6 o'clock. Uh, we'll start a new class series on that. We'll stand and sing, Make Me a Servant, and then have a closing prayer. <clears throat> Make me a servant.
Let's bow. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for giving us this opportunity to worship together as your church. Dear Lord, we hope that everything you have heard here today from our lips is pleasing to your ear. Dear Lord, we ask you to help us always to remember that we must abide in the gospel that, that Jesus Christ came to this earth and saved a lost and dying people that, that we have the opportunity to live forever in your arms in heaven. Dear Lord, help us to abide in your scriptures so that we might know the truth, that we might know the things that we're going to be asked to give an account of, not just on judgment day, but in this world when we have opportunities to reach out to those that truly need the healing grace of your son, Jesus Christ. Help us to know your word, to abide in those scriptures, and to be willing to share them when the opportunity arises, which is constantly, and we just need to seize those opportunities. Dear Lord, just help us to always to abide in you and know that, that only through you and your son, Jesus Christ, and your spirit can we ultimately reach the goal, which is to live eternally with you in heaven. The Lord be with those of our congregation that are sick or suffering and be with those right now that are traveling back to us after their holiday. Please help us all to be back together at our next appointed time. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.